it's going to sound a little cheesy, and I've, I've said it a bunch of times, but at the end of the day, the reason why the DevNet Zone and these things that we do exist is for community members. Like the purpose of this is to help people, to help people learn, become enabled to do things they want to do. But at the end of the day, like yourself, um, have a place where you can kind of feel like you belong with, I use these technologies, meaning Cisco or networking technologies in general. And we know that there are not just programmable interfaces, but there's more that can be done in managing and orchestrating and our networks as well as solving complex problems by using these technologies. But at the end of the day, like you can go to any place you want to, to take a lab or a course or what have you. So Torbjorn, I'm really curious from kind of your perspective, what led you in your career to start thinking about doing things like automation or using what we would just broadly call programmability as part of your, like, your day job, as the work that you do, but then also how did you kind of come across the idea of what we do in DevNet as a way to sort of learn how to do more of that? Okay, yeah, so I started at the TEA um, as an apprentice uh, seven years ago. And um, being an apprentice, you do the, uh, a lot of grunt work, yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> so whenever a lot of VLANs need to be created on a lot of switches, that's me. Um, I can imagine this was a lot of cable pulling. And oh <laughs> yes, yeah, a lot of it. Um, yeah, once you have created a VLAN a couple times, you you have done that. Um, so then I started looking at ways to do this in a more automated fashion. Mm -hmm. Discover DevNet, um, and yeah, found it interesting. And since started building onto that uh, that interest and competency. So coming across DevNet, but more importantly, coming across like you said, early part of your career, apprenticing, learning like, oh, what networking is isn't always you know just the glamorous stuff we love doing. Like, I'll configure a greenfield brand new thing. It's also, I gotta maintain stuff. We've got run rate stuff that's coming through. We gotta send new VLANs, build new sites, which is templatized sometimes. How, how did you kind of, um, not just come across the idea of automating those processes, but how did you decide when and where was a good time to say, you know, I, maybe I can make this a little bit easier for myself? Were like, there specific times when that happened or is it more of like just a general, I think I could automate. Well, uh, once you see highly repeatable tasks, that's an obvious uh, contender. And each time there's a high potential for uh, making a misclick somewhere, uh, <laughs> you need something to be uh, exactly the same. Uh, in those situations, uh, various automate automations can uh, make uh, life much easier. Yeah. Did it help you? Uh, well, actually, two, two questions on that. One is from a more sort of like, for anybody watching that wants to understand a little bit better, um, did it help you, do you think it like, in the, at least in the beginning, it actually helped you reduce like errors and things like that? Or was it more of like, well, I'm experimenting, we're gonna see how this is gonna go. Or did it like, no, this actually worked really well right away. Is there, or somewhere in the middle? Yeah, somewhere in the middle. Uh, a lot of experimentation. Um, sometimes it worked, sometimes I probably spent more time automating the task than it would take me. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a journey you need to test uh, to figure things out. For sure. How did, um, for like the, especially as an apprentice or whatever term is used in, in any part of the world for the place in your career that you were at, because um, in, like in the States we may not call it apprentice, but we would like just early in career, like you're just early doing stuff. So of course you're given all the, the repetitive stuff that your senior folks don't want to do necessarily. Um, how did others around you that you worked with take to you going kind of on your own, yeah, I want to figure out how I can automate this. How did, like, how, what was the reaction like from other people? Um, in general, good. Um, I work in a, uh, at a Cisco partner uh, where um, people constantly uh, try to evolve their skills. Um, so several of my colleagues had already started looking into the automation part of things and uh, yeah, it was well received and um, the difficult part is when you need others to uh, also take part in the automation. Um, that's a whole another journey where uh, it needs an, um, more of a team effort. Uh, yeah. yeah. Did, um, so in that, that's probably a whole other video we could talk about. But in that in that idea of like, it's, I mean, it's really good to know that others around you were receptive to the idea that hey, yeah, no, I like this. Let's let's we've done a little bit. You've done some. Let's play with it. Um, did you run it into any? any don't feel like you have to tell too much, but did you run into any pushback from any person or others that were like, I don't know if that's how we want to do this? And only if you did, um, did you find a way to sort of either make them feel better about it or did it, like, what did that come out? Because 
and the reason here's the reason I ask is so much I talk to people who come through and yeah, there are lots of people who come through the DevNet zone or other places who are like, oh my gosh, yeah, I've been automating, it's great, and I do all these things. Just as many people who describe what you're describing, but then run into a, a wall, because others around them are like, no, 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 we're not. That makes, for some reason, it makes them uncomfortable, either because it's change, it's something new, they don't understand it, or some other reason. There's a multitude of them. Yeah. And they run into this like barrier, and they're like, I'm not sure how to get past that. So I'm just kind of curious for you, if you encountered anything like that, and if you did, what was the experience like? Uh, people were mostly open to uh, these new concepts. Um, each time I have run, run into some resistance, uh, you abstract away things, you make things uh, in some ways less flexible, you know. Uh, going through the implementation of it with them it has usually helped a bit in having them accept. Uh, yeah, it's a team effort in whatever you do, so everyone needs to be on board. Uh, yeah. That makes complete sense. It, it, it just, when you do any, I mean, really when we do any work like this, especially as much as people may not think about it like this, network operations, network administration, network, any, whatever term anyone wants to use there, it is a very creative job. Like, yes, you are doing what people may consider to be non-creative type stuff, working on technology, et cetera, but there is a lot of creativity that comes into figuring out how to use the tools that you have, and I'm using the term tool very loosely here, but the tools that you have, to solve the problems that are in front of you. So there is a lot of creativity that comes into that. Um, okay, I'm gonna put you on the spot for a second. So, <laughs> a little lightning round sort of thing. My, my, something I'd really love to know from you is, of all the things you have worked on in your career, like projects, don't have to give specifics if you don't want to, but projects for customers, things for yourself, whatever it happens to be. What, if you had to pick one that was like, I helped build or I built this one really cool thing and I just think it was a lot of fun to build, if you could pick one, what would it be? It's a tough one. Um, currently working on a um, you know, fully automated uh, rollout of Cisco SDA. Oh, okay. uh, so where I've implemented a webhook receiver that uh, detects new PNP devices and such, and then does all of the manual steps, uh, automates them. Um, for a fairly large customer, fairly large, yeah, it's a significant time save and um, so like an actual full, when you say SDA, for software-defined yeah. access for anybody who's not familiar with the multitude of Cisco acronyms that we have out there, but okay, so like actually deploying SDA in that sort of way. You mentioned webhooks there to text yeah. out. What is what does that function do? Like instead of just maybe alerting something, what is is there a bi-directional component that's working there? Uh, well, yeah, uh, so the DNA center uh, will uh, send webhooks for various events. Right. So on my webhook receiver, I receive these events, and when I detect certain uh, events happening, I can trigger uh, certain workflows uh, from the other end against the DNA center. So that removes the uh, manual steps in between and uh, saves uh, a lot of time for everybody. That's cool. I, you know what? So I, I, there's a project that a, a one of our one of the TMEs inside Cisco built that was somewhat similar to what you're describing that leveraged uh, DNA Center and webhooks and an integration with ServiceNow um, to, and this person had built it up, built it out as like a pilot experiment for, I think a customer or some other group like to say, could we do this? And the idea was, I have people who work on a, like a partner or a consulting help desk. We don't want them to have the, the front line people that have direct access to a customer's network, but when that, that contract fires something off to say automatically, there's a situation happening, we need to jump in and triage it, but we don't want them being able to log in. They were able to like use a webhook to trigger alerts that popped up in ServiceNow and open up a case, and a person could click a series of tasks saying, let me try this, let me try this. They didn't have access, but exactly what you said, it manifested as, if I do this, it would automatically run a script that would connect back to the customer network, but the person interacting, like on the front line of that help desk, they couldn't connect in, they could just hit some buttons, and if it didn't solve the problem, so the reason I mentioned that is to come back to your use case, I think it's really fun and interesting for somebody to hear an example like you're describing because I think it, at least the way I hear it, it really shows that not only can you use these, these tools, webhooks, whatever it happens to be, to get notifications, et cetera, but the application developer component of it comes in a place where you're like, I can send this information to a place and that place can take that information and make an intelligent decision based off of it that can then return back to the network and make a change. Um, have you, I'm just curious, have you had any interactions with 
um, in your role or with customers you work with or clients where you're talking maybe with app developers or someone has app development background about how you can supply them information they weren't aware of they could get from the network? I'm just curious if you've had any experiences uh, like that. Yeah, some projects you need to uh, collaborate with uh, the more app developer type teams. But no, not something I do regularly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, I think that's one of the biggest challenges all of us have to work, still have to work through and figure out is we do all these lovely things. We teach all this stuff in automation, but the people who use developer tools, as we would like to call them on the network side, are developers. You know, and there's, they were around before we were doing these things, and they were writing code and doing that. And I think there's still a lot more for us to learn as a group. Like or as a uh, culture in the network engineering space from them about how we could be using those sorts of tools and mindsets to solve problems. It means we have a ways to go, but it's a really cool path to go down. Yeah, so we are, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it.